you so much. And uh, I would just like to say we've been regulated in the, uh, to 20 minutes, so uh, we'll try to get through all the points quickly. And I'm very happy to have our esteemed guests represented from across the globe speaking about this very important topic, especially at this time. So let's gr get right into it. And I'd like to, um, to talk about, since we have representation from different parts of the globe, could you talk about what the process of legislation is or, uh, of adopting new innovations into the finance space? What is your approach and how long does it usually take? Um, we'll start with Giuseppe. Uh, thank you, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and also for giving me the opportunity to set the scene uh, as a first speaker. As you know, we, we really follow the, the European process, which is quite complex and quite long, because we need to find an agreement across 27 countries and also to ensure consistency with uh, Basel standards where needed. But it is also important because uh, it allows us uh, to incorporate our lesson drawn from supervisory experience and also from our contact with the market, given also our you know, innovative channels that we have developed, for example, regulatory sandbox. Maybe I would uh, give you a few hints, really, to, to, set up the, to set the scene. First, what we see in the market is that, of course, most banks have started their digitalization transformation. And then we see not only just uh, new fintech companies uh, entering the market, but also joint strategic partnership, which is a very important development because then you have uh, much faster developments in the market. The second one relates to the challenges and constraints to this development, which relates first to the costs. Even though banks are supposed to invest a huge amount of money into this, then if you look at the overall uh, cost that uh, has been put so far, maybe it's not enough. Second, the second challenge is indeed that there is not enough investments uh, to address the, legal, the legacy system, which is, as you well know, uh, represent a constraints to further innovation and also to ensure proper data aggregation and reporting. Third, it goes without saying relates to the lack of uh, talent and people, not only at technical level, but also adequate competencies at the board level. My third point relates to the, what we are seeing in terms of the impact on, of the overall business model. The, the current uh, innovation is, uh, is uh, significant. And then we have uh, this uh, type of uh, platformization of the financial system, which allows uh, the new entering uh, of uh, new players in the system, which raises uh, challenges both in regulatory and supervisory perspective. But this is good because this uh, ensures and improves the biodiversity in the, in the market. But also raises challenges because maybe we, we are not able to use our fully fledged supervisory and regulatory toolkit, which is maybe one of, of the challenges. This leads to my last point, because if we have constraints, challenges, and opportunities, on the other hand, we also need to look at the risks. And it goes without saying that uh, we see a, a significant increase of uh, IT related risk, data integrity and cyber-related risk, which indeed deserves further consideration in the both regulatory and supervisory space. I will stop here. Amazing. Thank you for those insights. And um, in the light of recent news with FTX collapsing, you know, as an uh, example of a uh, crypto company, especially in a high risk, uh, and the world is still trying to understand, you know, about how to uh, regulate crypto and do it properly. So I'd like to go to Y to speak about how do you encourage confidence and agility while you have you know, something like this taking place? Do you have uh, an approach to that? And uh, do you see it's still worth the risk of you know, being one of the first uh, to r really uh, bring in regulation uh, into this new innovation? Right, that's a pretty tough question. Um, I think the term agile regulator seems like an oxymoron and it's always a challenge for us to manage as a regulator. But I don't think it needs to be self-contradictory, right? Um, as a regulator, if our rules and regulations are not agile enough, not fast enough to reflect market realities, then we lose our relevance. Uh, we, have, we will have difficulty retaining talent uh, and recruiting talent. Um, but on the other hand, we cannot do away with our institutional character as a regulator because we will lose that credibility, right? So how do we find the balance and to do that right, we have to get a few things right. Uh, I think first and foremost, a lot of this appreciation of risks 
comes with good judgment, comes with experience, right? Uh, and of course, as a regulator, um, the best way for us to find that kind of uh, expertise out there is to recruit, right? But the reality is to get someone with knowledge of finance, technology, and risks, uh, it's very difficult, right? Um, so we need to have the right tools and governance. So our approach to that is, in terms of the right tools, is that we, of course, have the regulatory sandbox, uh, which is an opportunity for us to get up and close with the uh, fintechs to understand the risks, their associated models, and to make a call as to how we want to regulate them. Um, so that's an important tool for us. Over time, we got more sophisticated, understanding the risk. So I think if a FTX were to come to us today, right, uh, you probably go through that process. Uh, we launched our regulatory framework for virtual assets in 2018. And truth be told, for us to reach that journey in 2018, we started in 2016 with the Sandbox. And back then, we were already interacting with a few of these crypto players. Right? So that gives us some insights as to how to regulate. Uh, but that said, um, having the tools is one thing, but having the governance within our uh, regulator is uh, also important. You need to have the right checks and balances. Uh, I think we trust in each other that we have the right expertise, the uh, right people uh, to form that committee of wise men, right? So um, I think uh, together we're quite glad, quite happy to be able to recruit a diverse talent of uh, regulators. Uh, and I think finally, having that committee of wise men is not going to be enough. Uh, at the end of the day, how much do we know compared to the industry? Uh, and to plug the gap, the only way to do so is to work very closely with the industry. So collaboration at the end of the day is key. Right? So I think those three points, uh, tools, governance, and uh, collaboration with the industry, that would be my take. Yeah, that's exactly, I, mean, I like what you said in terms of you can't predict what's gonna happen, but you can do what you can to uh, mitigate you know, the risk that's involved. And uh, Caroline, I can extend that to you as well. I mean, I know that the U U.S. You know, put out legislation re recently in June and has been discussing you know, whether, uh, has, has, has had a lot of discussion about this, whether it's a commodity or security when speaking about crypto. And it's been an extended conversation. Can you describe that process and say, for example, like in this case, you know, with FTX, you know, what are the things that they're keeping an eye out for? Uh, and is it affecting you know, the decision making that's taking place at the moment? So I have to give my quick disclaimer, which is that the views I'm sharing today are just those of my own as a commissioner. Uh, you know, when we look at what's happening, I think it just makes this more imperative than ever that there must be a focus on risk management, and risk management must be at the core of the business. And besides that, we have to ensure that these crypto financial activities are brought within the regulatory perimeter so that they are held to the same standards as other financial firms. This is, I think, a critical point. It's something that's been widely recognized at the international level. And so I look forward to the US continuing to make progress at adopting and adhering to that same standard. Because when we are in a framework of global markets, the risk cannot be contained within any one particular jurisdiction. And that's why it's more imperative than ever that there are no gaps. Thank you. And um, I'd like to bring this question to the UK as well. Because, uh, as we know, India you know, hasn't really uh, made crypto a legal tender in the country. But can you give us what India's approach has been you know, to crypto? And maybe there are other priorities um, you know, in the innovation space when it comes to finance that you're dealing with. Okay, allow me to set the context first. And uh, uh, as we speak here today, uh, uh, the G20 meeting is, is on in Bali. So let us look at what is the political mandate to all the regulators so far as FinTech is concerned. And the G20 mandate is very clear that they have to serve the real economy. The regulators have to ensure that FinTech serves the real economy. It helps in channelizing money, all the savings and investments, and it's, there is a fair and equitable access to it. If we look at all this, then we realize that uh, 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 fintech is uh, not a means in itself. Fintech is, uh, sorry, fintech is not an end in itself. It is a means to the larger end. And keeping all this in mind, um, in India, uh, uh, two, three things uh, have been guiding the regulators, both the Reserve Bank of India and SEBI. Number one is that the innovation has to reach to the largest section of the society who do not have access to financial services. And there are some great stories which have, which have developed in the last seven years or last eight years. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that as we go along. Mm -hmm. 
but so far as uh, 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 crypto assets are concerned or so far as the uh, uh, virtual assets are concerned uh, there is a taxation now so if somebody has a gain on the on the capital gain side on the on the sale of uh, uh, virtual assets that is taxed uh, people are allowed to do trading or 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 have a deal but uh, the banks have not been permitted as of now uh, to deal with the crypto assets. So we are somewhere in between, and I think the approach of the regulator is to wait how things develop, how the regulatory framework is uh, strengthened, and maybe going forward, I'm in no position to, to say when it will happen, but maybe uh, we'll be making some move. And obviously, the regulator will also learn from some of the mishaps which have taken place recently or are likely to take place. So keeping all that in mind, they will be taking it. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Thank you. And um, that's thing. I think that's what's very interesting. There are different approaches to the same matter of like something more conservative approach. Some want, will take the high risk you know, to be able to adopt the innovation early and uh, you know, as it develops. And I'm curious as well, if you don't mind elaborating on what are the other financial technologies that you're incorporating in India? Because crypto isn't the only thing that exists. Mm -hmm. And what else is necessary to really move, especially a larger population, forward when it comes to the fintech space? Okay. I'll, I'll talk about something which is called the India stack. And India stack, uh, uh, the basic infrastructure has been provided as a public good. So government and the public sector have provided that basic infrastructure. And it is modular in nature. It is something which even uh, uh, a small person can access. It is something which can be accessed by even larger uh, companies without any discrimination. It is available 24 by 7. Mm -hmm. And based on this stack, other facilities can write. For example, your identity track, your, your, your services track, transfer of goods track, all that is developing. And this has had a huge success in the last seven or eight years. And this has been developed by the Reserve Bank of India and its affiliates uh, with the cooperation of the banking system. So that's one thing which I would like to talk about. And the numbers are huge, so I don't have to talk about it. The second is about access to credit. In that area also, some innovations have taken place, and I would like to mention that it's called account aggregator. So account aggregator is a, is a fiduciary, it's a data fiduciary, and uh, uh, while they can pass on the data, they can transfer the data, they have no right over the data. They can't even see the data. They can't even store the data. And based on that, uh, how credit can be given, and in India and maybe in other parts of the world, there are issues about providing uh, credit to a small and medium enterprises. So here it, what it does is that based on the account aggregator, which can access data, for example, from the goods and services tax agency, from the direct tax agency, from electricity bills, and whatever you have. Mm. And based on that, you can go to a set of, to the account aggregator, who will pass on your request to a set of bankers who are already registered there. And you'll be surprised to hear that uh, an amount, for example, as low as $25, that can be provided, and that can be provided in a span of 10 minutes. And another thing is that uh, you as an intending borrower, provided you have given your consent for that uh, data to be shared with the bankers, you are not approaching bankers. You are approaching a platform where those bankers are, are, are there. And then based on how they evaluate you, they will be offering rates, and the lender has the choice, sorry, the, the borrower has the choice which bank to go. If there are four banks and there is a differential, he can choose any one of them. And the regulatory framework says that you don't have to go to your own banker. You may be having banking relation with one particular bank, but you can go to any of these bankers which are registered on the platform. So this is the type of innovation which is happening. Oh, very interesting points. And um, going back to the process of uh, legislation around uh, for, for regulation you know, on new innovations in the finance uh, sector. Uh, I'll direct this to Caroline and to Giuseppe. Uh, how, especially since you're both in reasons where the conversation uh, is in Europe as well, it's uh, between the EU, has been an ongoing discussion and it takes a while to get consensus amongst different groups in the US, you know, between different parties. Do you find that process aids or gets in the way 
of reaching consensus and moving forward? So in the United States, of course, we have a very robust political system and, of course, in an election year, there is a lot of debate and discussion. But what I think is important is under the U.S. system, the regulators have been delegated and authorized with significant authorities and tools to address their respective markets. So the CFTC is an activities-based regulator with a two-fold mission to ensure market integrity and to prevent market abuse. And so there are a number of tools and authorities that not only the CFTC, but the SEC and the bank regulators have to ensure that they are upholding the safety and soundness of the financial system. I think that the United States approach has you know, clearly unlocked American innovation if you think about fintech more broadly. Uh, we have also the deepest and most liquid equity markets in the world. So I do think that the US system works, uh, but in an election year, there's always a lot of debate. Of course. And uh, Giuseppe? Okay, I, as I said, in, in the EU, indeed, we have a very long and complex process which involves a lot of uh, different stakeholders and takes time. But I think that uh, we, we should not forget that we are fully involved also in the in definition discussion at international level at the G20. And I think it's important always uh, to ensure consistency between, on the one hand, uh, the, the G20 development, and on the other hand, some European specificities. I think that uh, if you look at uh, also uh, what's happening now that, uh, with respect to innovation, innovation is a good thing. There is no discussion about that. We should promote innovation. Even ATM in the past was a significant innovation. So innovation helps uh, uh, help grow, help make the, the process much more efficient, but we should never forget about the risks. So in the end, the regulation uh, is just a way of implementing principles that uh, should be adopted by firms in the first place. When we talk from a prudential perspective of uh, informed governance of risk, this means that uh, it's the board or the top of the firm that should look and understand that the risk. Then you should have fully integrated data aggregation and reporting to the board and also a lot of uh, skills and competencies. We have not discussed about data. Maybe we do not have time. But in order to ensure some type of consistency at the global level in order to tackle these uh, global challenges, it's true that we need some data, because without data, we might take the risk of uh, regulating the wrong development with the wrong tool. So I think that if you receive a request for data, it's not just a, a sort of a bureaucracy, but also a way to better understand what's going on in, in the industry and the market. And I think it's also in the industry interest to work together, like it was said before, because I think that we share the mutual objective to try to, to develop a, a much better market and, and good practices. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, I mean, the CFTC is unique among U.S. regulators in that it also has the mandate to promote responsible innovation and fair competition. And part of that is because the CFTC's roots go back to a wholesale market where you had uh, dealers and uh, other financial intermediaries, exchanges, clearinghouses, and so on. So the pace of innovation oftentimes outpaces the speed of legislation or regulation. And so that's why the CFTC has a principles-based uh, regulatory approach, which can adapt and anticipate new changes and new risks to market structure more quickly. Definitely, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, I think where I'm uh, trying to go with that, and that was a very, a very good answer. Uh, in terms of, you know, with innovation, it's something you can anticipate, but you still have to act, but at the same time, create the regulation so to protect the market. And uh, why I'll extend this to you, while addressing as well um, what UK had about, you know, what are other innovations that are uh, entering the uh, innovation finance space? And how do you address that? I mean, you, uh, the UAE has had, and Abu Dhabi has had a very short uh, uh, has really acted quickly, sorry, I should say, in um, creating regulation to bring in the innovation and to be one of the first to, um, to implement it. So how do you act when, for example, you have something that that's new, that's uh, that new, um, with an, if you don't mind giving an example of, like, say, another innovation that's coming into play and how you're addressing that in the short term? Um. The kind of innovation that we're seeing in this region uh, might not be um, what other jurisdictions see, right? So when I speak about the innovation that we're seeing, it's very much probably peculiar to our region here, right? And I think uh, we have made a strong start at least in the DLT space. Uh, and then that's a combination of essentially the government vision as well as enabling regulations. So that trajectory seems to be still uh, going forward uh, very strong despite the recent uh, uh, turbulence in the sector. 
Uh, and one of the latest things that we are seeing is actually in the area of um, um, institutional grade um, DRT solutions that have programmable capabilities using smart contracts mm. uh, to move, issue, and store digital assets, right? And that's a very mouthful, right? Um, but I think just a subset of that, I think um, D5 is essentially something which uh, we are um, seeing uh, coming our way, uh, a lot of queries coming our way, and partly because we see the potential of D5, uh, the compostability of D5, in where you take the output of one smart contract to fit into the input of another smart contract, and in the way you string the various bits together, uh, allowing the possibility of various uh, modules to be automated in one transaction. To us, that is very powerful. Uh, so we see that as likely to be the future of uh, at least in the financial sector within uh, the region, um, which is why in April, we launched a discussion paper where we share our thoughts and views of how we could potentially regulate this space. And it's essentially, we don't exactly know how to regulate, but we want to pull uh, the views of the industry. And to pull the views of the industry, we decided to go out first with what we think could be a possible model. Uh, and um, the idea is to work with the global community to evolve a regulatory framework that we can potentially regulate. Right? So, um, and of course, as part of that journey, we also recruit, um, invite um, DeFi players from around the world to join our regulatory sandbox to work with us. Right? So, the crypto winter, has somewhat dented a bit of the appetite, uh, but at least from what we are seeing in the early waves, right, are actually institutional players doubling down on cryptos to provide institutional grade solutions, for example, custody. Right? Uh, there are players in the gaming industry looking at um, uh, moving into the financial sector or financial services space. Uh, and you know, gaming um, industry, they always use their native tokens, and traditionally it's within their own uh, ecosystem, but increasingly we're seeing them having solutions that actually go beyond their ecosystem, where they allow tokens to be swapped with uh, the larger virtual asset space. So that is something which we are seeing, and we are now trying to see or race with the industry to see how fast we can come up with something that would be able to cater, cater to their innovation and to regulate them in a responsible manner. Definitely. No, that sounds fascinating. And I think it just shows that anytime we think we've reached you know, the limit or, uh, of innovation, then there's something else providing a new solu solution. And also how important it is to manage the relationship between innovative solutions to move us forward, but also security with regulation and traditional institutions uh, to work together. So unfortunately, that's all we have time for. But thank you so much for your insightful views and uh, we hope to continue the conversation. Thank you.